Hello and welcome. I am Mary Jo Taylor, your presenter for this and all the videos in this series. A general outline of all the material in these six videos are provided in a handout for your use to add to your notes and comments and questions. You can obtain a handout at the church office or by contacting me directly. Today we're going to continue our discussions regarding the covenant in the Bible. And last week, we investigated the first three covenant types, blood or servant covenant, the salt or friendship covenant, and the sandal or inheritance covenant. Today, we'll continue by learning about the marriage covenant. Last week, we tied each of these covenant types to the six specific biblical covenants mentioned in Scripture, as shown in this chart, and also page 25 of your handout. And so here, we see how the Adam and the Noahic covenant uh, both talked about the blood of the servant covenant. In Adam, it was the beginning of restoration, of covering our sinful nature is demonstrated. And in Noah, restarts this recreation and rededication to Yahweh. Abraham has both a salt uh, and the sandal covenants, and he was promised generations and a land to live in. The Mosaic Covenant is both a blood and a sandal covenant, and uh, here God's law and system of sacrifices, worshiping and feast days, and it was all about obedience and inheritance was focused in that covenant. The Davidic Covenant or David's Covenant is a sandal or inheritance covenant, and he was given the eternal dynasty as the ruler and kings of over God's people. And the Messianic Covenant is the marriage covenant, and it talks about how this restoration with God, our relationship and dwelling with God can be completed. And that's what we'll get into today. On page 27 of your handout, um, there's a brief summary just to summarize the real important points from last week, and that is that uh, covenant and testament are not the same thing. A covenant is a mutual agreement defining an ongoing relationship between the parties without end. A testament is a legal contract defining the obligations between parties with a definite beginning and an end. What's covered in the Bible are covenants, not testaments. The Bible recognizes four types of covenant, service, friendship, inheritance, and marriage, in that order. Each one involves a deeper, more intimate relationship than the one that went before. No new covenant replaces an old one. Each covenant incorporates the provisions of the previous covenant and builds accordingly. I would also say that God introduces those covenants to us as we're able to handle it as uh, human beings. Yeshua modeled communion at Passover via the wine, the bread, and the foot washing as our way of constantly renewing the three covenants with God. And we'll talk about that a little bit more today. But let's get into this marriage covenant. Marriage is the combination of the three previous types of covenant, servanthood, friendship, and inheritance. In scripture, after scripture, God identifies himself as the bridegroom, and God recognizes all those who enter into all three forms of covenant with him as the bride. There are tons of references all the way through scripture talking about the bride and bridegroom. And today, hopefully your eyes will be opened about that. References to the Hebrew marriage covenant and to members of Christ's church, either as being part of the bride or having the opportunity to become a bride, rise to an absolute crescendo in the book of Revelation. You can't know scripture if you don't know covenant, and you can't truly understand covenant and not many passages in the New Testament, again, including the book of Revelation, if you don't understand the ancient Hebrew marriage rituals and ceremony and the purpose behind them. So we're going to figure out how it all works. 
first ancient Hebrew marriages were arranged, but not in every tiny respect. The ancient bride and groom had more choice in the matter than many of us may realize. Parental approval was essential, but the initial impetus often came from the young people themselves. Though a wedding was a significant social and religious event, it was also a process involving commitment and covenant, the fulfillment of which often took several years. So the first thing that happens is the groom and his father go off to meet the girl's folks. Will she open the door and what is Shadukin? Shadukin refers to the first step in the marriage process, the arrangements preliminary to a legal betrothal. It was common in ancient Israel for the father of the groom to select the bride for his son. Son. An example of this was Abraham in Genesis 24, verses 1 through 4. And in this passage, Abraham makes arrangements for his son's Isaac's wedding, but, and he usually did it himself, but Abraham couldn't do that. And he selected a representative called a shadkan, or a marriage broker, or a matchmaker. Um, and so sometimes this would be done with a matchmaker or through the, uh, the matchmaker would have already set up uh, uh, the initial uh, talking points prior to this off to meet the parents. The prospective groom brought his father with him to the bride's house, bringing with them a betrothal cup, wine, and the anticipated bride price in a pouch. When they got there, they knocked. The bride's father would look to see who was there through a little window. The question was, will she open the door? It was up to the prospective bride to open the door. If she said yes, for all practical purposes, the commitment to work through the betrothal process and arrive at a fully functioning marriage was made at that moment. Therefore, hers was not a lightly made decision, for the issue was not can we have a wedding? Once the door was opened, the only remaining question was, we can have a marriage if we can work out the terms. So what will they be? Notice the prospective bride really has a key decision here. Step two is she is serious about me as I am about her. Oh, let's go back. I, I, I did that a little too fast here. Let's go. Step two. All right. Is she serious about me as I'm about her? Even as the bride opened the door, she could end the whole process at any stage. In fact, once the initial agreement was worked out through animated discussion and formalized written contract, the bride was really the only one who could still back out right up to the very instant before marriage consummation. She could stop the whole process at any moment and she didn't even need a special reason. At the same time, once his initial proposal had been made and accepted, the groom was utterly and totally committed. Only by a writ of divorce on extremely limited grounds could he ever back out. Now we're going to go step two. Her mom is a good cook, hopefully. We're on page 28 of the handout. Once everyone is gathered inside the bride's home, they would work out all the details of the wedding. They would eat dinner with the bride's family. And members of the two families would drink three of the four betrothal cups of wine at established points in the negotiating and wedding process. God established four cups of wines as milestones or markers to signify exactly where the betrothal parties were in their negotiations. Each cup corresponded to a covenant, but it also represented something that all the participants had to physically grasp, to physically consume, and make a part of themselves. It goes without saying that each person would have to participate mentally and spiritually at each step of the way, or the process would break down. Just as a diversion here in FYI, there are four cups taken during Passover, which symbolize sanctification, deliverance, redemption, and acceptance. These are very closely related here to both the covenants and the marriage covenant proceedings. 
This is a beautifully, it, it, it describes beautifully the saving action of Christ in our lives as our bridegroom. Let's move on. The cup of sanctification is the first cup of wine. It represents the servant or blood covenant between the two families. This cup was consumed almost as soon as the door was closed and everyone was inside. The groom, his father, and every member of the bride's family above the age of 13 participated. Each member of each family uh, and the groom and father represented their entire family was agreeing to serve the other family to help each other out, to have each other's backs or interests at heart. Sanctification embodies the idea of setting ourselves apart for God. In effect, they were making a sacred commitment to become one giant family, each member serving all the new and existing members. Thus, the support structure underlying ancient Jewish marriages was very strong, and I would add it continues today. This is exactly what Jesus is saying in Revelation 3.20. Listen, I am standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to you and eat with you and you with me. You open the door. He comes in and the restoration process begins. And at that point, you already have salvation, but now he is asking if you will enter in the covenant of betrothal with him. Will you walk in loving relationship with your bridegroom? This is a much deeper understanding of this verse than we're normally taught. This Bible verse is not directed to those who do not know Jesus Christ already and is not about being saved. It is about growing a deeper relationship through progressive covenanting with God. We will talk about this salvation issue at a later time, but I want to be more focused here. This is so interesting and so much different than I originally understood this to be, uh, this verse to be. Let's continue with the second cup of uh, the cup of bargaining. And the second cup represents the salt covenant between the families. This cup was consumed by the bride and groom and their two fathers only. The two families represented here by the fathers were covenanting to become eternal friends with their joint son and daughter and with each other. As they ate, and yes, this included bread and salt, members of both families haggled over the details of the marriage contract called a ketubah. We'll talk more about that later. This is usually where the negotiations were going to break down if they ever were going to. But if they managed to surmount all the difficulties, the families entered into a friendship covenant, even as they established the terms of the upcoming marriage. The issues the families established were straightforward and direct. Who would pay for what part of the wedding? What skills would the bride and groom each pursue to contribute to the marriage? What financially are they each bringing to the marriage? And the bride's primary responsibility was to purify and prepare herself, remaining pure, while the groom's responsibility was to go away and prepare a place for her to live. In John 14, 1 through 3, it says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know to the, the way to the place where I am going. This verse is not about what heaven looks like or an explanation that God has different mansions or places for various denominations or for different religious believers to go after death. Christ is talking to his beloved people like a groom talking to his beloved bride. We are not hearing the love that is inherent in this passage and the point that Christ loves us so much that he wants all his people to be in a close relationship like that of a groom and bride. And Yeshua is promising to take care of us forever. 
Christ, even now, is preparing a new heaven and new earth for creation to continue on so that we can live with him. Within the Hebrew culture, there's a certain amount of table pounding and fist raising, and that's absolutely normal. Every family didn't. Man, if you weren't willing to stiffen your necks and to defend your beliefs, what good were you, right? Well, God's kind of the same way. He clearly responds to those who come to him boldly, but honorably. God is not automatically offended by interaction, not even disagreement. We're talking about relationships here, which sometimes require very spirited dialogue that will flow in two directions. God wants to work out a personal relationship covenant with you, one that you will adhere to, one that challenges you in some ways, but not so much that you fail. God wants all of you, but only when you are ready. So what is the state of your negotiations with God about how much of your life God has control over now? When negotiations turn to outright defiance, you know you're on thin ice, which is what happened to Moses in Deuteronomy 3, verses 23 through 26, when Moses pushed one too many times to see the promised land. But until that point, God is perfectly willing to listen to your objections. Sometimes he'll even modify his game plan as long as the wrestling doesn't turn into rebellion. In similar fashions, Philippians 2.12 says, We are admonished to work out your, our salvation with fear and trembling. So when's the last time you did some respectful table pounding with God? What does it take in our lives to get to the point where we really need to have it out with God? Do you remember a time when that happened? What happened your, with your relationship with God? Are you past that point? Or are you at a detente, holding your line with a neutral zone in between? Is it time to settle things between you and God? Not because it's near the end of your life, but because it's time to move on. God wants a deeper relationship with you. Or is it that you've not felt confident or daring enough to table pound with God? To some extent, I'm not sure this is good either. It might be a confidence issue with God or potentially a lack of love on your part. Are you confident that God, will, that God loves you absolutely no matter what? This means respectful table pounding is okay and frankly welcomed. It means you're engaged with God and have passion for God. If you say that you've never needed to table pound with God, my prayer is that I hope you get there because it will change you and make you closer with God. And if you don't care enough about the issues you have with God to table pound, well, even more prayers are sent your way so that you can experience the love of God in a very real way. Let's talk about an example from scripture it, it, with Jacob and Israel wrestling with God. You know, as the church today, we've inherited for better or worse, this role of being peculiar people called out from the world to wrestle with God, struggling with God and struggling done by means of prayer, earnestly and humbly seeking God is, is something that we do. The name Israel means one who struggles with God, and Israel is the name given to all God's people. Jacob, or Israel, in uh, Genesis 32, was struggling for a blessing. Ever since birth, Jacob had struggled with men to receive the birthright that would give him the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant. Here, he was shown that in all his previous human efforts to gain the blessing through deception, his real enemy had been God, or so he thought. In Hosea 12, the nation of Israel was told to do the same thing as Jacob did here, prevail by prayer to God, not by looking for help from human sources. Jacob's struggle was a physical picture of his need for God. And many years later, the nation had the same need. 
Jacob learned that as the heir of the covenant promises, he had nothing to fear from humans. Wrestling with God for his blessings should release all believers from their fear of lesser mortals. Our truth kind of through this is that God could never be forced to yield to Jacob. The only hope for a blessing from him, from God, was to hold desperately to God and beg for it. Jesus spoke of an unwilling judge who nevertheless aided a widow because she would not let him rest. God is not unwilling to bless us, but his help awaits our humble pleas. It is not that he enjoys seeing us abjectly prostrate before him, but it's in such a desperate condition that we realize both who we are and how much we need God. Sometimes this desperate condition is in seemingly unceasing tears, and sometimes it's table pounding. Jonathan Sachs writes, quote, Jacob's life embodies the fact that truth must be fought for with determination. It rarely comes without a struggle and the pain of experience. At the bottom of page 29, there's space for you to take a break and pause this presentation and write down your thoughts for about table pounding, issues that you have with God, outstanding things that something you need to, to respectfully confront God about and enter maybe a new phase in your relationship and your negotiations with God on what that looks like and how you can uh, carry that through. So go ahead, take a break if you have time or come back to it at the end of the presentation. Moving on, the next cup, the cup of redemption or the cup of inheritance represents the Sandal Covenant and signified the shared inheritance of the marriage partners. This cup was drunk at the end of the meal by the bride and groom only to signify their exclusive commitment to each other, along with an increased level of intimacy. It also officially sealed the marriage between them. Once the bargaining was over, the families brought in a scribe who wrote out all the terms of the marriage co covenant in a formal agreement called a ketubah. Ahead of time, the scribe probably had some of the boilerplate written out in advance, so we only had to add some specifics of the uh, various situations. And then, at that point, the young men of the family would hit the streets and blow their ram's horns, trumpets, called shofars, announcing to all the world that the bride and groom were officially married. Even though neither the ceremony nor the consummation had yet occurred, nevertheless, and this is key, from that moment on, they're married, and if either one died, the survivor would fully inherit the deceased partner's possessions. Until the late Middle Ages, the marriage consisted of two ceremonies that were marked by celebrations at two different times with an interval in between. First came the betrothal ceremony called Erusin and later the wedding, the Nusun. At the betrothal, after the third cup, the woman was legally married, although she still remained in her father's house. She could not belong to any other man unless she was then divorced from her betrothed. The uh, a word arusin means betrothal, and this period, which is called kadushim, meaning a sanctification or a set apart, this word really defines the purpose of the betrothal period. It's a time in which the couple are to be uh, set aside to prepare themselves to enter into the covenant of marriage. The Jewish understanding of betrothal has always been much stronger than our modern day understanding of engaging, uh, understanding of engagement. The betrothal was so binding that the couple would actually need a religious divorce in order to annul the contract. And this option was available uh, to the husband as the wife had no say in any divorce proceeding. 
this point will um, will be important when we talk about spiritual implications later. After the couple had undergone their mikvahs, which are baths or immersions uh, separately, um, the uh, they would express their intention of becoming betrothed or engaged, and they would appear under the chuppah or a canopy. Um, from ancient times, the wedding canopy has been a symbol of the new household being planned. While under the chuppah, the couple participated in this ceremony where items of value were exchanged, like rings, and if they hadn't done it beforehand, the third cup of wine to seal the betrothal value, vows. After the ceremony, the couple was considered to have entered into the betrothal agreement. This period was to last for one year. During this time, the couple was considered married, yet did not have sexual relations and continued to live separately until the end of the betrothal. We see this time of betrothal illustrated in the Gospels as reflected in the lives of Joseph, Joseph and Miriam, Mary, uh, in Matthew 1, 18 through 25, when she became pregnant through the Holy Spirit uh, with Jesus. Recall the Last Supper in the upper room described in John 13, 4 through 14. Yeshua offered his inheritance of this heavenly kingdom to his disciples by removing their sandals and washing their feet. He was giving them a new inheritance, his own. He was establishing a relationship of purity and at the same time fulfilling the promise in John 1, 12 through 13, which says, but to all who receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. Yeshua also graphically led his disciples into the blood and salt covenant at the Last Supper through taking of the wine and the salted bread. Remember that wine is considered an acceptable Hebrew alternative to the shedding of blood. It's called the blood of the grape. And this is why we currently observe communion as we do. He also made further reference to his coming marriage with his chala, his called out ones, knowing it was customary for the groom not to drink wine again until the wedding ceremony. That is why, or that explains why he said, he would not touch the fruit of the vine again until he could do so with them in the kingdom of heaven. He maintained his vow when he refused the pain-numbing wine the soldiers offered to him while he was on the cross. The communion in the upper room is a picture of the covenant sequence, except that Yeshua reversed it. Usually, it's service, friendship, and then inheritance. But Christ first removed his disciples' sandals and washed their feet. This is the inheritance covenant. Notice that Christ gives us everything first and up front. Next, he broke the bread, which was friendship, and he asked us to be his friend. And then lastly, he passed a cup of wine the covenant of service. And in love, Christ is asking for our service. Finally, then he went on to shed his blood on the cross a few hours later in the ultimate blood covenant, the ultimate and final sacrifice for the sins of humanity. In view of all this, when we take communion Every single time, we need to recognize, yes, what he did on the cross, but it's equally important to remember that we're making a recommitment to pursue him, to wrestle with him, to be his friend, and to manage his estate. When we take the cup, we are committing again to serve him, to obey him, and to follow his rules and ordinances. For the commitment we make at communion is the same as what a bride and groom make to each other. Each time we take communion, we are literally reaffirming our commitment to be Yeshua's bride. 
from God's point of view, the meaning and import of the four covenant types is not up for discussion. God offered mankind a betrothal contract at least 6,000 years ago and sealed the terms 2,000 years ago. It's also not accidental that the cups of wine of the betrothal covenant overlay and reinforce the covenants in sequence. All this happens on purpose because God was building a seamless mosaic of concepts that has at its foundation a commitment to establish and maintain a relationship leading up to marriage. And this is the ultimate responsibility, and hence it requires the ultimate covenant. The fourth cup was shared between the bride and groom only during the wedding ceremony itself. The fourth cup, or the cup of praise, also awaits all those who are chosen to be the bride of Yeshua. It will be taken on the wedding day and will forever seal Yeshua's union with his beloved. We become eligible for the fourth covenant only after we've met all the previous requirements by entering, entering into the first three covenants. The decision to do all that is ours alone. However, Yeshua chooses his own bride. Again, this is not salvation. This is for special service with Christ that we spoke about in our study on the book of Revelation. For those that receive a crown and reign with Christ, with this comes much responsibility and work in judging and managing the new heavens and earth. What is the ketubah? The ketubah is the marriage contract. It has five parts to it. First is the combined family history of the bride and groom, which details the family trees and some anecdotes. The second part is a personal and family history of the bride, again, with their more detailed treat and anecdotes. Third is the personal and family history of the groom, again, with the tree anecdotes. And fourth, which is lovely, comes the story of how the bride and groom met and some stories regarding that. And fifth and final section details both the bride's and the groom's responsibilities before and after the wedding concerning the marriage. The ketubah required seven signatures or seven seals. Yes, for those who studied Revelation, there's a connect there. These came from the bride, the groom, the two fathers, a scribe or in later times a rabbi, and two witnesses. The first five books of the Bible correspond exactly to the five parts of the ketubah. Genesis provides the family history of the bride and the groom, all of creation. Exodus gives the personal family of the bride, the chosen people of God. Leviticus provides for the history of God's family, the Levites, the priesthood. And Numbers tells of God's love affair with his people in the wilderness and records his joys and sorrows as he reached out to the bride. Deuteronomy specifies the responsibilities that both the bride and the groom must fulfill. The first five books of the Bible are written as a marriage contract between God and his people. From Klein and Spears opinion, the Torah, those seven signatures come from seven major players. Remember our covenant patriarchs, they play a very important role in the marriage contract. They believe that Adam and Noah were the two witnesses, that Abraham, the father of many nations, was also the father of the groom. Jacob was the father of the bride. Jacob or Israel, the father of the 12 tribes, basically the people of God is how you would understand that. Moses was the scribe. He wrote down the Torah as God dictated the first five books of the Bible. David is often called God's beloved, and he is the persona or the one representing the bride in scripture. And then finally, Yeshua, Jesus Christ, representing salvation, is the groom. Step three, the groom needs to get to work after all this, okay? And there's several things he will be doing here. 
The first is he needs to come up with a bridal payment, and that really should have been done at the end of the negotiation. Um, this is about, uh, the bride price was 30 shekels of silver in Yeshua's time. It was 100% refundable if the bride turned out to be impure or pregnant. Um, this is sometimes uh, this gift was paid by the groom to the bride's family, but ultimately it belonged to the bride. It changed her status and set her free from her family and um, her parents' household. And there's several examples in the Bible. Um, the, this mohar is also illustrated in our relationship to Yeshua. We're told in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, that we've been redeemed with a price. We are also told that our bride's price is not just silver and gold, but his own life in 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19. The second thing the groom did is to come up with a bridal gift or a matan. It was the Hebrew word for gifts given by the groom to the bride in addition to the mohar, the payment. It was given following the betrothal ceremony as a pledge of his love for her. Its purpose was to be a reminder to his bride during the days of their separation of his love for her, that he was thinking of her and that he would return to receive her as his wife. The word matan means gift or pledge. In Greek, the word is charismata or gift. Paul tells us that this pledge or gift is the Holy Spirit, a promise of love, and that he will return to us. We can see that in Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. And um, it could be that this is also fulfilling Jeremiah 31, 33 through 34, that this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The third thing the groom had to do would be to prepare their home. And we already talked about in John 14, 2, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Well, that meant that he had to build, furnish, decorate the home where he and his bride will live. Sometimes it was connected to his father's house. Other times it was just a room added on to his father's house. And other times, if they were real fortunate, it was a separate dwelling. The, the building and the furnishing process itself could take a year or even two, during which the bride and groom had very little contact with each other. In this enterprise, the groom was under the ironclad rule of his father, who was the only person empowered to judge when the groom's bridal preparations, as per the ketubah, were sufficient and complete. In Mark 13, 32, we read, But of that day or hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. That's in Mark uh, 13, uh, 32 through 37. And what are we cautioned to do? We are cautioned to stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening or at midnight or at cock crow, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you all is keep awake. I find it very interesting. And this relates to the step three. What do the bride and bridesmaids do? They have a job on. Keep awake. Are the lights on? The bride was also to keep herself busy in preparation for the wedding day. This is what we're doing right now during this time. Specifically, our wedding garments were to be sewn and prepared. During this one-year period, the bride would consecrate herself and pre prepare holy garments for the upcoming marriage. As the groom finalized his preparations, he would let the word slip out that the wedding day was near. Meanwhile, the bride's family and friends would begin preparing feast. The brides and bridesmaids would buy enough oil to keep all the lamps lit for at least two weeks. 
The bridesmaid's job was to watch for the groom's arrival. When they saw him coming for his bride, their lamps would show the way. They were also expected to warn the bride, a small but important job. According to tradition, the groom could come any time between 6 p.m. and midnight on the second through the fourth day of the week. And this is key here. When he did come, he had to see his welcoming bride's light in the window. If she let it burn out, he would simply take it as a sign that she had either changed her mind or simply didn't care anymore, and he would turn away and leave her in darkness. It's critical to have enough oil to keep burning. Where do we get our oil from? The Holy Spirit. As we uh, worship God and share in service to Christ with fellow believers, give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning. Please hear what was stated here. He would let the words slip out that the wedding day was near and the groom would come any time between 6 p.m. and midnight on the second through the fourth day a week. When Jesus Christ comes a day, comes again, might this be a clue to the timing? For those that have ears, listen. And then the wedding party. So when the groom arrived late in the evening, he'd be accompanied by a rowdy crowd of groomsmen blowing shafars and pounding drums all of uh, whom he selected in advance. Um, usually, while building a residence for his bride, they would help. All would be males. All would have close relationships with him. Their job was to guard him and announce his coming by the blowing of the trumpets. Meanwhile, the bridesmaids would warn the bride that her suitor was coming, as if she couldn't tell for herself with all the racket going on. The final step in the wedding process is called nisun. The word uh, comes from the Hebrew verb nasa, which means to carry. This is a graphic description as the bride would be waiting for her groom to come to literally carry her off to her new home. As soon as they got to the home of the bride, they would whisk her away. A little bit different. They do this before the actual wedding, as opposed to our tradition is carrying the bride over the uh, uh, threshold of their new home. A little different here. So at that point, one bridesmaid would actually hurry to the wedding site and uh, close by uh, where their new home will be. And there the family and friends would light it up with lamps and start making the final preparations. Hey, more oil is needed. Through the rest of the night, the wedding couple and their attendants would celebrate with roast lamb and bread and plenty of wine. This special event was only for the bridal party alone. The wedding would be held on the next day with guests and relatives coming from all over. Sounds like an ancient rehearsal dinner. Just as there are four cups of wine in the betrothal process, there are four general types of mikvah, which are baths or baptisms even, for repentance, a deeper dedication to God into, into ministry, and, and into marriage. The four types of covenants here are all related to these different types of mikvahs, um, but I'm not going to go into super details here. Let it be said, though, a few hours before dawn, the groom and his men would leave the bride with their bridesmaids, and her friends would lead her to a mikvah, a ceremonial bath, where she would be bathed in running or living water. Following the mikvah, the bride's attendants would anoint her with fragrant oils, and she would return home to rest for a few hours. Though it's not mentioned in the actual narrative, to prepare for betrothal, it was also common for the groom to separately take a mikvah as symbolic of spiritual cleansing. As in every Hebrew mikvah or baptism, one would bow forward on into the oncoming stream of water, facing the source of water as an act of love and a submission to God, the source of all life. The ancient Hebrews knew full well where life come from, uh, came from. Therefore, by honoring God through the mikvah, by submitting and subjecting their lives to him, they brought into play another major symbol of covenant and purification. 
As her wedding day dawned, the bride would then return to the place of the previous night's festivities. The groom would be waiting there, all in white garments with threads of gold and fragrant with a set of, scent of myrrh, cassia, and frankincense. The eschatological bride and groom have already undergone the waters of mikvah or immersion as detailed in scripture. Yeshua, at the beginning of his ministry in Matthew 3, 13 through 17, and we, his bride, in the cleansing waters in each of our baptisms. Recall Christ's baptismal scene. Recall the scene where the woman anoints Jesus' feet. Recall the gifts of the spices at his birth. A lot of times we're taught that these spices were for Christ's burial. Well, I'm not so sure anymore. I think they just might have been for his wedding or his anointing at Bethany. Then the wedding ceremony. The groom escorted his bride to the chuppah, a dome of bright crimson cloth, its colors symbolizing their covering by the ancient blood covenant. The groom would also be wearing a wreath of fresh myrtle and roses, thorns included a symbol that their love would bring him joy and pain. As I read this, I kind of thought that Jesus really only had the thorns, only the pain thus far from his bride. I look forward to when Yeshua is wearing the roses. In addition, the bride would have a circlet of gold shaped into the silhouette of the city of Jerusalem. This is a key for the understanding of Revelation 21 too. The couple would perform the wedding ceremony themselves during which the groom would pronounce his bride pure, holy, and set apart for him alone. They would speak seven blessings over each other and vow their eternal faithfulness and love. After completing their vows, they would share the fourth cup of wine together, the final step in the long betrothal process. When they finished the fourth cup, the groom would place it on the ground, put his foot on it, and the bride would rest her foot on his, and together they'd stomp the cup to pieces, assuring that no one else would ever drink from that cup, thus signifying the exclusivity of their relationship. The bride and the groom would take a triple braided loaf of challah bread and bless it and break it and dip it in salt and feed it to each other as a further pledge of their friendship and a renewal of the salt covenant. And then the groom would give his bride a new inheritance by removing her old worn out sandals, washing her feet and putting on a new pair of sandals. Both of these customs clearly reinforce the biblical covenant, the foundation underlying Hebrew marriages and on which modern marriages as well should stand also. At that point, the bride and the groom would sometimes exchange rings, placing them on the right hands, not on the left hands, as is our custom today. The bride and groom are considered king and queen for a week, starting on their wedding day, and the queen stands at the king's right hand, and so therefore the bride must symbolically be at her groom's right hand, which explains the placement of the rings. At the end of the Hebrew marriage ceremony, the groom would sped, spread his arms around her and wrap her up in his tallet, his prayer shawl. The tallet has tassels or fringes hanging from each corner, which are called tzitzit. The tzitzit are actually four cords doubled over and knotted in a distinct pattern, numerically spelling out the name of God. The tallet and the tzitzit are also understood as a wing or a covering. See Matthew 23, 37. Thus, when the groom covers his bride with the tallet, he is protecting her, but also making them as one, even as he covers both of them with the name and the word of God. The moment of Yachud. Is she pregnant? After the ceremony itself came in the moment of Yachud, or physical unity. The parents of the bride would invite the guests to enjoy the feast, and the party would actually last for a week. Meanwhile, the bride and groom would slip away to a private place, and the marriage would be consummated. 
If the groom discovered that she was not a virgin, or worse, already pregnant, the whole situation would immediately change. And the groom had four choices in the ancient culture. First, he could let her pay the price for her unfaithfulness, which was death. Second, he could quietly give her a writ of divorce and walk away. But this approach was risky for her because if later on other witnesses came forth and accused her of, adult, her of adultery, the law would require her to pay the death penalty. Thirdly, he could pretend the child was his. If he discovered the truth before the wedding, he could forfeit the ceremony and begin living with a new wife who was already married to him, frankly, from a legal point of view. This is essentially what Joseph did with Mary. Although the trip to Bethlehem and the two years sojourn to Egypt among strangers allowed them to escape any social fallout. This option, however, is not available to our Redeemer bridegroom. Our God requires that his son's bride be pure and holy. Finally, he could choose to be her Goel, her Redeemer, and take her place, take her punishment upon himself. In the case of sexual impurity, he would pay her fee, death. This is the choice that Christ has already made for his bride. During the marriage, the groom could also redeem his bride for violating Torah in other ways as well. Whatever her violations might involve, including monetary debts of all kinds. The biggest drawback in this approach was that the groom could never again refuse to pay for any required redemption as long as they stayed married. He had established a potentially harsh, harsh precedent. One once he redeemed her, even the one time, he had to pay the same price every time she violated the Torah after that, as long as she was his wife. This totally explains the story of Hosea and, frankly, Christ forgiving us again and again and again. Now, Let's consider the scriptural parallels. Way back in the Garden of Eden, Yeshua was faced with a bride who had rejected him. Yet still, he made commitment to pay her bridal price. He also immediately began the complicated process of remarrying humanity, starting with the first blood sacrifice in Genesis 3.21. Here it describes the garment of skins that God provided Adam and Eve as katanot, which is the name for the Hebrew bride's first layer of wedding attire. In other words, God was clothing Adam and Eve in bridal garments. He was saying, here, I can solve this problem. Will you take the first step in remarrying me? Will you accept me by first serving and obeying my principles of restoration? This was the first step in the process of wooing humankind back into the kind of ultimate relationship that God has wanted to have with us since we were created. Through the covenant process, God chose to provide a means by which his bride could be healed and mended so her groom could see her as pure, not because she was pure, but because he had paid her price. The marriage covenant is the culmination of the previous three covenants, servanthood, friendship, and inheritance. It's offered to all of us, but relatively few accept its privileges and responsibilities. The bride and the groom take four cups to complete this marriage, the last during the ceremony or the wedding celebration itself. What is often called the Torah, meaning the first five books of the Bible, is written like a ketubah, an ancient Hebrew marriage contract. Yeshua has redeemed us exactly as an ancient Hebrew husband could redeem his sinful wife. And Yeshua does this again and again for all of us. Yeshua has already shared the first three cups of betrothal wine 
with his intended bride, his people. Only one remains. Spend some time thinking about covenant. What is the overall goal of entering into a covenant with God? How do you view that? Where do you see this? And where are each of us in our covenant plan and our relationship with God? Spend some time wrestling through that if you can this week. I hope this presentation has opened your eyes to deeper meanings behind some of the well-known verses in the Bible that point to the understanding of the marriage covenant. Wait till you apply this to the book of Revelation. It's amazing. It contains the details on what will happen when Christ comes to take his bride, the church, and the, all the people of God to the marriage supper. It also contains the details of the wedding ceremony all the way through the time when they are married in covenant and establish themselves in the home which Christ has prepared, the new heaven and new earth. It is the end story of God's love relationship with humanity, his most beloved of creation. It is what we as God's people can look forward to and hold on to in times of great testing, trials, and peril. It is what will happen, a foretelling, not of specifics with a known timetable, but events that must take place to bring God's plan to completion. God wants you to know these things and take them seriously. We need to look forward to the amazing celebration we will have all together as God's people celebrating the marriage of the Lamb and the Bride, Christ and his people. I hope to see you there. Until then, God bless you and keep you, and may his graciousness shine upon you. Amen.